All right. Here we are. Welcome to the Friday live stream. This is a Q&A where I answer your questions about Jesus, God, the Bible, Christianity, all of those sorts of things. And today's first question is going to be about self-loathing. And I think this is, um, I mean, it's not a fun topic, but it's a really interesting topic for a number of reasons. Um, oh, let me dig up my first question. I, where did I put it? Oh, I'm going to loathe myself so much for this. Um, here it is. No, here it is. No, no, no. It's always action packed here on Bible thinker. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Sarah, maybe you can send me the question or I'll read it word for word. Um, <clears throat> but here's the deal. The question's about self-loathing versus self-love. You know, we have a certain amount of self-loathing going on in our lives. We have a certain amount of self self-love, we could say, going on in our lives. And, well, how do you balance that as a Christian? What does the Bible say in particular about the self-loathing part? Because I think we're, we regularly hear, as you read scripture, you know, verses and teaching about self-love about not being a lover of self. In fact, let me share with you three verses that talk about that. And then we'll talk about the self-loathing verses, which which is going to be disappointing to you. I'll just tell you up front. Um, but here we go. This is the um, self-love verses, Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. I mean, this is this is super extreme, right? Like a lot of our culture would think this is actually too extreme. This is too too much. We shouldn't do this. Um, but <clears throat> this is what Scripture actually calls us to, as far as selflessness. Don't do anything out of selfish. It doesn't mean you can't have ambitions. You want ambitions as a Christian. Ambition's good if it's ambition for good things, not selfish ambition. Ambition for the kingdom of God. Ambition for others to be blessed and helped. Ambition for godly things. Um, and consider others more significant, count them more significant than yourselves. Does it, does this actually mean other people are more significant than you? No. And you're not believing that what you're doing is you're treating them as if they're more significant as a way of expressing love and kindness and graciousness towards others. I will treat you like I'm not more significant than Jesus, but when Jesus got on the cross, he treated me like I was more significant than him taking on my sin uh, for my sake. So I think that that's the example that we follow there. Uh, it's not a delusion about my significance. It's it's a, a loving way to treat people. Here's another selfishness verse, First Timothy, Second uh, Timothy three two. People will be lovers of self, literally self love as an attribute that you focus on, is a description of the fallen and wicked ways that people live in the last days. Right. This is understand this that in the last days. There will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money. People are openly lovers of money, openly lovers of self in our sort of, well, how else can I put this? But in, in, the, in, the, in especially the more liberal minded sectors of society, but not exclusively. Okay. Um, it, on a pop level, people are lovers of money and lovers of self, proud, arrogant. These things are not even considered flaws in a lot of ways in, in Western culture. I should really put it that way, Western culture. Um, that's more accurate. I don't want to isolate it to liberal uh, culture because it's not isolated there, even though the, that culture is sort of wedded to these ideas in a strong way. Well, you've you've got that. Okay, that's a big problem. Um, what about Mark 12, 31? <clears throat> it says here, the Jesus speaking of the second commandment of, uh, as far as like the two great commandments, you shall love... The, your neighbor as yourself love your neighbor as yourself so self-love is assumed as like a, a something that everyone loves themselves but in any way when you in which you emphasize self-love you need to love yourself you need to take care of yourself you need to be good to yourself when you start emphasizing these things you move into this realm of like danger zone okay it doesn't mean every time someone makes a statement like that it's a problem but it definitely lends toward problems when you start talking about how you need to love yourself, you need to take care of yourself. Okay, I would I would rather say take care of yourself as if selfish motive is the reason. I say you need to be a good steward of the body that God's given you. You need to be wise with your time. You need to do things that are healthy and godly and upbuilding um, for, for yourself and others. But this isn't to put self on a pedestal. This ultimately puts God on the pedestal because we're obeying and honoring him and serving him. Okay, well, so that's the selfishness verses. <clears throat> There's a lot more. There's tons of them. 
What about the self uh, loathing verses, and I can read the question to you guys now. Let me uh, thank you, sir, for sending that to me. Um, as Christians, how do we deal with self-loathing without indulging in and practicing too much self-love? All right, so it's finding that that balance and realizing that self-loathing can be a problem. Um, okay, biblically speaking, if you if you Google verses about selfishness, you get a whole bunch. If you Google verses about self-loathing, you get like nothing, or you get all these verses that you're like, that's not really about self-loathing. It's, it's as though the worry about self-loathing was not on the radar of the biblical authors for like 1,500 years. That's strange to me because it feels like it's very much on our radar now. We're very much worried about mental health, which I think mental health is something to, to care about and be worried about. But I think that we uh, our culture sometimes misunderstands what good mental health means. Um, at least on a popular level. I'm not sp- speaking about psychologists and psychiatrists and stuff because I'm, I'm just more familiar with how normal people talk about these issues. And <clears throat> there are no real self-loathing verses. Does that mean that you should be self-loathing and there's no rescue for you? No, that's that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm, I'm only saying that the bigger problem that we should probably worry about more is selfishness. And now I'm going to hazard some some parallels in the scriptures where we could say, hey, here's some examples of people that maybe did something like self-loathing in a negative way and it caused great harm. And so we can learn from those examples. So the first example I'll pull up is going to be Judas. Judas Iscariot. Judas, the, 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 not, the not fondly remembered Judas. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 5. Listen to this. After Judas had betrayed Jesus, Jesus goes to be condemned. He gets killed on the cross. Um, and this is before the resurrection, Judas, here's how he responds. Some people don't realize that he had, there's an end of Judas, Judas's story here. It says, then when Judas, his betrayer saw Jesus was condemned, something happened here. He changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. This would seem to be a good moment. Okay. Him, him saying like, I did something wicked. I I see the, the 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 sinfulness and the horribleness of what I've done now in a deeper way than I did before. And so you might be thinking Judas is heading towards like repentance. He's heading towards transformation. He's heading back to the disciples like, oh, what can I say? I I, I don't even deserve to breathe the air you're breathing. But that's not what happens. Um, so they say, what's that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the, the, the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. Judas hanged himself. He actually killed himself. He killed himself when he was at a moment where it might have led to repentance. To me, this is this is perhaps we could parallel this to a modern idea of self-loathing in the negative sense, in a, in, a, in a genuine like, hey, don't do this. Don't go down this road. If you are down on yourself because of your sins, because of your failings, because of where you where you've really blown it. And I mean, can you be more down on yourself than Judas was with realizing he'd betrayed G- Jesus, the Messiah, and, and his eyes are being opened to that? Um, <clears throat> not that he didn't know what he was doing ahead of time, but there's something that would happen. He changed his attitude about it in some sense. And there you stand where you're on the precipice of what could be repentance and could be forgiveness and could be salvation. And instead, you distance yourself further from God. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to seek for hope and transformation. I'm not going to look for grace. I'm just going it, to, it's over. I give up suicide. I give up um, disfellowship. I, I'm, I'm not going to be in church. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to seek the Lord. I give up. So anytime guilt is leading you further from God instead of close to God, instead of running to God, then I think that that's a kind of self-loathing, self-loathing potentially that is unhealthy and bad. And it's like, you are dis, you're dishonoring not just yourself, but God and his own and his grace and his kindness and his love by pulling away from him at a time when you should be drawing near. Um, so conviction of sin in your life without feeling any hope for forgiveness or, or transformation, that to me seems like self-loathing that we don't want as Christians. And there's a biblical example there that, that seems to dictate this. And I'll give you a verse for it a little bit later that helps support that. Um, let's talk about Cain, though. In Genesis, there's going to be three guys I talk about. One is uh, Judas, one's Cain, and the other one's Moses. So Cain in Genesis 4, <clears throat> he kills his brother, God confronts him, and then he comes around and, and he's saying, um, hey, my punishment is greater than I can bear. 
God, God's like, hey, you're, you're going to be a vagabond and all this stuff. Behold, you have driven me today from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. This is an interesting response. Cain literally murdered his brother in cold blood, gets busted for it. And his response after all that is, is to be, woe is me. Oh, poor me. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry for me. Uh, but you don't, I know I did wrong things, but you don't understand how hard it is for me. This is clearly a woe is me little, let me, let me get you the world's tiniest violin kind of thing. I think for Cain, um, I can't handle this punishment. His punishment was not even as bad as what he did to his brother death, right? Cain doesn't get that. So this is, this is where we avoid genuine responsibility for our sins. Okay. Unlike Judas, who's it's like Judas, someone He's always saying, Judas, stop. There can be grace. This is at least my attitude. Of, if I had run into Judas and saw him, what he was doing, I'd be like, Judas, stop, stop, stop. This is exactly what, what, what the blood of Jesus will be for, is to forgive sinners. You could be an example of someone who who um, who, who can be a pillar of, of just demonstrating how kind and gracious God is. But with Cain, it's different. You want to wake him up and go, stop, 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 you little crybaby. You're just ignoring how bad your sins are and saying, woe is me. So this is a kind of self-loathing that I think avoids responsibility where I say, I'm not going to face up to how bad my sins are. I'm just going to complain about how, how bad my situation is because of my sins as if I'm the victim even of my own sins. And I, I see people do this where their attitude towards their sin, and, and I know I can be tempted to do this too, is, well, I've done this and this and this, and now it's causing me all these problems. Woe is me. And my focus is woe is me, not I need to deal with my sins. I'm reaping what I've sown. And I, I think that Cain is an example here of a bad a bad way of dealing with these things. Um, so the, that's my opinion. Okay, you may understand this Cain story because it doesn't tell you how to interpret this, his attitude. But I do think that when I when I look at it, I go, well, God's being pretty gracious to Cain. He doesn't kill him for this. Um, he has a punishment. And then he even gives him a, uh, the sign of Cain, right? He puts a mark on Cain, which was a blessing, by the way. It was God protecting Cain, again, being gracious to him. Um, <clears throat> some people think, though, the mark of Cain is uh, like a race. They try to turn into a racist thing. You guys have heard this, right? So-and-so, the, these this group of people has the mark of Cain. If they do, then that means you better not kill them because God will avenge them. So it's just the dumbest thing. Uh, but no, it wasn't like a genetic thing that passed down anyways. It was just a mark on Cain individually. It wasn't going to be on him and everybody descended from him. That's just not there. And anyway, the next one we'll go to is Moses. Moses is the next like um, uh, example, I think, of possibly what was me kind of attitude. Now, keep in mind, Moses had, he before this passage, he had tried to, do a little deliverance of the Israelites where he was sort of the, 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 in the Royal house of Pharaoh. And he was walking along and he saw, uh, an, an Egyptian abusing a Jew and he killed, struck and killed the Egyptian and then, you know, buried him in the sand and stuff. And his sin had been found out, right? He was thinking, it seems, as you look at all the scripture, it seems to me, he was thinking that maybe they would see that he was going to help them and they could look to him as being like a source of deliverance. And instead, they, they tattle on him, and everybody finds out. Now Moses is in danger. Forty years goes by. He flees Egypt. He's there. Forty years goes by. Here's a man who has no more confidence like he did before. Here's a man who thinks, like, they don't respect me, or they wouldn't listen to me anyways, because they didn't then. Well, Exodus 4.1, God tells Moses, you know, I'm going to send you as my as my messenger to the people and we're going I'm going to deliver them. Moses says, "But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice." Now there's reason why he would say this, right? Or for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. So he's worried they won't believe him. So God gives him a sign. Okay, he has his staff that will turn into a serpent as you read this passage, or his hand that could become leprous and then become uh, you know, healthy again, or the the water turning into blood. He get, he's like, "I'm going to give you miraculous signs to prove that you are who I say." Then in verse 10, Moses has a, a second objection, right? Um, oh my Lord, I'm not an elo I'm not eloquent either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and tongue. Like they're not going to listen to me because I can't talk good. Uh, I don't. I will not. It's not just I can't talk good. I think that if for those who've been in leadership, you understand. It's that feeling of, will people even follow my lead? 
right? Like they're not going to follow me. I tried this before and look at me. I ended up out here, a loner, lost everything. And so um, he's like, yeah, they're not going to follow my lead. They're not going to listen and respect me. It's not going to happen. And then, you know, God's like, I made, I'm the one calling you. I'll be with you. You need, I'm going to give you the ability to do this. And then in verse 13, his third excuse comes and he just does not really excuse. He just says, Oh Lord, please send someone else. <laughs> and Moses, I always get a kick out of this because I understand it. I understand, the older I get, the more I understand. When I was younger, I would have been like, send me. You know, I feel like more like I, Isaiah, send me, Lord, send me. And then the older I get, the more you have these like broken times in your life for times where you feel like you failed and you're like, Lord, maybe you should send someone else. <laughs> and and I, I get that feeling. Okay, I understand it. But these are all the, the woe is me or the self-loathing that causes paralysis. It's not keeping you from seeking your own. And this, this is where I'm going to apply it loosely. Okay, use your judgment if you think this is a, a correct application. Moses's excuses and responses to God here are not anything about God's kingdom. They're all selfish self-loathing. Oh, I'm not, they're not going to listen to me. Who am I that listen to me? Or I don't speak well enough. I'm not going to be able to command people's respect. Or please just send someone else. This is self-loathing. Or it might feel like self-loathing. I don't know if Moses would call it that. But to our modern ears, modern concepts, we might call it self-loathing. This is self-loathing that we claim is, oh, I'm just, I just have a low view of myself. But really, it's just excuses so I can stay in my comfort zone and continue to pursue my selfish goals. It's a selfish self-loathing. Self-loathing that just makes excuses to not do what God calls me to do so I can stay in my comfort zone, do the things I want to do, keep my nice routine going in life, and, and, and just say, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not going to be successful. Please let someone else do that. That is a selfish thing disguised as self-loathing, I think. So so there's here's a few self-loathing things that I think we can maybe glean from some examples, Judas, Cain, and Moses. Um, here's some questions you can ask yourself if you're experiencing self-loathing right now. You feel like you are and you're not sure how to respond to it. Is your sorrow, is your self-loathing, is it true? Is it true? Because what you'll notice with Judas, all his feelings, his negative feelings about himself were actually true. If you'll notice with Moses, the negative feelings were just excuses. They weren't necessarily, they were in a sense they were true, but they weren't relevant. God's sending you. So what's the point? Why, why do all those other issues matter? Um, with uh, with Cain, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't true. <laughs> and so it, are, are these things true? Um, another thing you could look at is Jesus himself, last Bible passage. Well, I guess I'll go to two more Bible passages and we're going to go to all your guys' questions. Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Jesus tells this story that involves a lot of self-loathing. And ironically, the guy that's self-loathing, by modern definitions, is the, is the one who's in the right. He is the one with a better, better perspective on life you know, we have to have a full rounded picture on these issues. And here's Jesus on this. All right. So Jesus tells them a parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous to some people. If you don't think you're a really good person, you are self-loathing. Well, eh, Jesus is like, Hey, this is for you. <laughs> if you're so anti self-loathing that you're going to say that, um, two men went up into the temple to pray one, a Pharisee and the other, a tax collector, the Pharisee standing by himself, prayed thus to God. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Okay. Is that self-loathing? I won't even draw near to God. I'm going to stand far off. I will not lift my eyes as I pray. I'll look down out of shame. I will beat my own chest because I am just so distraught over how wicked I am. And he cries out, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus' response, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This, is, this isn't really an, un, an unbiblical or a bad view of self-loathing bad experience of self-loathing. This is a good thing. This is a healthy thing because it's entirely true. Tax collectors were rightly seen as some pretty messed up individuals for, they were doing extortion. 
uh, frequently, and they were <clears throat> betraying their people in different ways. So you can dig up the history of tax collectors at the time. Am I saying this is true of all tax collectors? No, I'm not saying that. But it is tr true of the tax collectors in the first century uh, where Rome was using them in specific ways and they were adv taking advantage of their roles um, to extort. So, so this is interesting. This is good self-loathing, okay? Good self-loathing, if you want to call it that. If you're, if you're going to throw the term self-loathing the way our culture does, then I think there's an aspect where self-loathing can actually be good. Here's, here it is. Um, and please listen to all I say about this issue and don't just take a clip of me saying that out of context. Well, it's already happening. I already know it. I already know there's like three atheist channels making videos about it. Mike thinks you should loathe yourself. Anyways, um, they should loathe <laughs> that they're doing that. All right, so qualities to look for. Um, you have a sober look at sin. That's good self-loathing. I'm just looking at my sin honestly. I'm making no excuses. That's healthy. I am taking total responsibility for my sin. Unlike Cain, right? I'm taking responsibility like this tax collector. I'm going to I'm gonna be serious about it. It's my it's my responsibility. I'm not going to blame it on my parents. I'm not going to blame it on my culture. I'm not going to do any of that. Um, and I have a broken attitude about my sin. I'm like... Uh, my sin really matters and I'm really broken about it. And I, I feel like I can't move forward unless I deal with this sin. Amen. Good, good, good. But he also has hope. He also has hope for forgiveness. He, he, now here, here's what would be bad self-loathing. The tax collector stays home and doesn't even go to the temple. The tax collector doesn't even pray. He doesn't appeal to God for mercy. That's the bad self-loathing. The good self-loathing <laughs> leads you to a place where you appeal to God for mercy. So you can soberly look at the reality of, of the brokenness of your life and of not just brokenness like it's happened to you, how you have broken your life, how you have sinned, right? And you're not just a passive receiver of this stuff. You've done horrible things and you feel horrible about them. That's healthy when you know you can then turn to God and receive mercy and grace. Much of our culture would respond to the tax collector differently. They would see him at the temple beating his chest. You don't even look, don't even look up, don't even not. I feel so terrible. And they would tell him, Hey, you know, you do good stuff too. Like tax collector, you're so valuable. God loves you so much. You're so valuable. You're so valuable. Your sins are, are no sins are all the same. You know, your sins no worse than anybody else's sin, tax collector. Oh, you're you're really a good person. Deep down, I think we're all good people and you have to find the angel within, you know. And a lot of our culture would do this and they would cut off his path to repentance, his path to salvation, his path to forgiveness. Sometimes self-loathing is the thing that drives you to the cross. And that's exactly why Jesus is like, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Because you, you have that awareness of your spiritual bankruptcy that you that you you need. You're needy. All right, last scripture passage I want to take you to, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. I always go to 1 Corinthians when I say 2 Corinthians. Why is that? Why do I do that? Here we go. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved. Okay, so Paul wrote them a letter when they and they were very much grieved about it. And he's like, I, I'm rejoicing not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. That's a perfect example of proper self-loathing. The goal of a Christian is not, I want to produce self-loathing in myself and others. No, it's, I want to bring people to God. And I would be rejoicing if they're brought to God. Yes, it will grief will come as they realize their sin, but that's healthy. Um, for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance or self-loathing that's good leads to repentance. Whereas worldly grief or self-loathing that's bad produces death. Judas. Here we have the tax collector and Judas held side by side. And we go, ah, there's a huge difference here. Um, the self-loathing of both men is, is, is actually correct, but it was bad self-loathing because for Judas, because it led to him just giving up and rejecting God and rejecting all, all the grace that might've been there for him and giving up on life and killing himself. Proper self-loathing says, I'm going to go to God. He's the only one who can help me in this. And so I would say if your self-loathing is without hope, it's bad self-loathing. If your self-loathing is without realizing you can appeal to God for grace and, and forgiveness, it's bad self-loathing. If self-loathing is leading you to give up on life and give up on good things that you should be doing, it's bad self-loathing. But if it's self-loathing that that causes you to be aware of your, your sin, honestly, um, and leads you to the cross of Christ and gets you motivated to bring transformation and change into your life, that's good and healthy. You're just having proper awareness of sin. Um, and, and if the self-loathing is just feeding 
your ability to turn down godliness, like with Moses, where he's he's just going to reject what God wants him to do. That that's also bad. So there's some thoughts on that. Um, and, and quick random announcement. This is something that matters to me. Don't know if it matters to you guys or not. Um, I, I do this, all these videos and streams in my own house. This is just one of a bedroom in our house that we sort of given over to Bible thinker purposes. <laughs> and what, uh, what you hear frequently in these videos is my air conditioning kick on because it just gets way too hot in here, especially heat. The cold I can handle better. The heat just start dripping. Well, we recently just did an upgrade. And the, um, I had, uh, Oscar and George from Celestial AC. Thanks guys. Appreciate you. I, they watched the show. That's all I want them to know, uh, that I'm grateful for it. They installed a mini split in this room so that it can basically silently keep the air at a good temperature. And they had to put a lot of work in it to do that. Right. So I'm very, very, very grateful. Um, so you won't hear the <sighs> kicking on all the time, especially as summer is now approaching today is like 88 degrees outside. So it's a good day to have it. Okay, so I'm going to your guys' questions, which um, we have all 20 questions already. And here's the first one. Or second question, but first one from the live chat. Okay, anonymous question. From a biblical standpoint, standpoint is there in any reason that Christians believe we evolved from monkeys? I'm confused why some Christians believe that, and I'm curious if it's a purely worldview standpoint. Well, I think if I'm going to be bluntly honest about it all... Um, a lot of Christians believe it. Let me let me just categorize. Okay, so some Christians, well, they believe in evolution. Okay, I need to get us all on the same page. So evolution has is a term that has a wide variety of meanings. Evolution can mean um, change over time. Okay, then it could apply to anything. Um, the coffee I'm drinking changes over time because it gets more cold. Okay, it's not evolving in the biological sense of 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 that. Um, but then there's change over time biologically, which definitely happens. Flu virus changes, coronavirus changes over time. All sorts of things change over time. There's been tests and stuff on that. Then there's, then there's in addition to that, a, a theory of this related to change over time that all organisms have a single common ancestor. Okay. So we're looking at one living thing that split up and eventually evolved into all the living things that are here on earth. Uh, that, that's universal common descent. Okay. Then on top of that, we have something called abiogenesis where we go from just chemicals with no life on the earth to where all of a sudden there's a living organism that reproduces and has the ability. Now, now evolution can actually take place biological where it actually changes over time. Um, so those who accept those last two things, not speciation, not the, but universal common descent and abiogenesis. Um, and some of them don't even accept abiogenesis. But but those who accept that side of things, I'm going to take your question to be referring to those people. So from a biblical standpoint, is there any reason that Christians believe we evolved from monkeys or I'm going to say universal common descent here? Um, I'm confused why some Christians believe it. And I'm curious if it's purely a worldview standpoint. Um, so people believe it because they feel like there's different categories. People believe it because culturally they're just told that that's the case and they don't question it. Other people believe it because they think that there's good solid evidence for it. There's plenty of people like that. They just think there's good evidence for it. Now we'll talk about the Bible in a second. Um, there's other people um, who believe it because they feel like there's good evidence for it. Well, you could debate about which category really exists. Um, in my experience, most people who believe evolution or disbelieve evolution are ill-equipped to talk about it intelligently. It, that doesn't mean they're not intelligent people. It doesn't mean they're not reasonable people in other ways. But when it comes to this particular issue, they're often under-equipped education-wise to handle it and to talk about it. Even sometimes like biology students and stuff like that, where you go, oh, you have the talking points, but you don't really have the details here. It's a big subject that can be challenging to deal with. But let's talk about why a Christian would, you know, how biblical can you be if you're going to say, I believe in evolution? And I've... Personally, and this, uh, this is a tentative video. Like maybe I'll come out with a video in, in, in a few years or something where I can give more clarity and offer a different perspective on this. So let me offer my tentative perspective for you to just think about, just consider. Um, I was very firmly in a young earth creationist camp for many years. Of course, I'm at a church, at churches, the different churches I had been at, where it was always the same way, young earth creationist camp. And... Um, I would feel like I had to defend that 
scientifically. And so I would try to learn that stuff. I, I don't actually go down that road anymore for a few different reasons. Let's spare that for another video sometime. But then um, over time, what actually sort of shook me, not not exactly change my mind, but, but shook my confidence, not on whether the earth is young or old, but shook my confidence on whether the Bible teaches the earth is young, was some of the exegetical statements being made by old earth creationists, where they would get into Genesis in some detail. And some of this stuff seemed pretty far-fetched, right? Um, some of the theories, I'm like, that ah, doesn't seem to work very well. But other ones, I thought, oh, well, that that seems like it's at least possible. Like That, that might be an, a right way of understanding the Genesis passage there or responding to the claim about, say, Yom always means a 24-hour period when it has an ordinal and, and, and a number. Like, that's a, a talking point for Ken Ham. And, and, I, and you look and you go, oh, that, I don't think that's actually true in Hebrew. So if that's not true, that was one of the reasons why I would have been super firm on that issue. Oh, when you, you could actually find examples. Like in, I think it's Hosea, I think. Um, I shouldn't, I, I don't know if, off, the, off the top of my head which one it was that kind of unseated that view. Um, and so I should say initially, exegetically, I started having some doubts that we had such a, we should have such strong confidence that the purpose of this passage in Genesis is to teach us the age of the earth. Uh, one of the sticky points for me is the genealogies of Genesis, and I I still remain open on that. Like Genesis one and two, uh, especially Genesis one, I'm I'm very open personally exegetically to having an, the age of the earth. I'm not talking about evolution here, but the age of the earth. Then with um with uh, the genealogies Genesis five, I think that's a lot harder. I'm not really sure exactly how to parse that out. And I haven't heard, a, I'm just unsettled on the topic, to be honest. So I don't have a public teaching where I'm declaring, this is what you should believe about the, the age of the earth. I, I hold off on that stuff because here's me in um, just in some openness on the topic. So I just say, I'm, I'm not going to teach on issues like that when I'm not confident what exactly my conclusion is. So now, like, let's say that a lot of Christians feel that way. Maybe a lot of Christians are in my camp at this where they go, I'm actually a little bit open on some of these issues because I felt like I was more confident before, but as I heard some counter arguments, it did unseat some of the confidence that I had in a, maybe a young earth creationist perspective, still hundred percent believe the word of God. If the Bible is teaching young earth, then I'm, I'm going to, going to be seeking to defend that because I believe that God's word is true, but is it actually teaching that? That's, that's the question. Um, well, um, I'm, I'm one of those who would be like, yeah, I'm open. Now, when it comes to the topic of evolution, I think that what happens is there's people who are even a little more open than I am on that. And they go, oh, yes, well, Genesis perhaps is just laying out a general facts of reality, right, about creation and about God's activity in creation. But it's not even intending to be taken as a literal historical account all the way through. Now, that sounds like blasphemy to some people, but let, let me say this. If that's true, if Genesis, the intention of the writing of Genesis is it's not intended to be taken as a literal historical account all the way through. Maybe it is from Genesis 12 on, but maybe Genesis 1 through 11 is not meant to be literal historical account all the way through. If that's true, then you actually suddenly have more open space for greater degrees of evolutionary change and stuff like that. Um, this is kind of the position that William Lane Craig has recently taken in his book, which I have somewhere, um, where he talks about, I think it's called In Search of the Historical Atom. And I've not focused on the science. It, it's written in two, two, two sections. There's one, the science section, that's the second half, and the first half, which is the theological section, which is a um, kind of like a genre analysis of Genesis 1 through 11. Forgive me, you guys, if I'm, if I'm speaking beyond or over the, the heads or, you know, I don't mean like your intelligence, but maybe over some of your, your, your breadth of information that you've got on this issue. I apologize. It's, I'm a little scattered in my answer here. I admit it. Um, but William Lane Craig's case is that Genesis one through 11 is, and I'm not, I'm not settled that this is accurate. I don't know. Um, is that Genesis one through 11 is a genre of writing that is meant to convey real historical truths along with archetypal, let me use my word there, archetypal, you know, pictures and descriptions so that you have in, in, in the conclusion you have a re there's a real Adam and Eve. Okay. They were really created Adam and Eve, 
but the statements all about every specific thing that they did, it doesn't have to be all literally true. It could be like representative of the historical realities behind them. He calls this, and, and the term's going to confuse you right away, and I wish I wish he would use a different term. He calls this mytho-history, the genre of Genesis 1 through 11. Um, I think the term is totally misleading to normal people because you hear myth and you think, oh, fake. And that's not what he means by myth. Um, he means it in, there's a, in um, folklorists, I'm trying to remember the details here, folklorists, that is like guys who are scholars in folklore and stuff, they look at the word myth as referring to something very specific that doesn't mean fake story. Okay, it doesn't mean myth like the way you commonly use the term. So rather it's archetypes that are being given, but all the details are flexible so as to communicate the heart behind the story. Okay, the, it, it, now is he right? I don't know. You asked the question, how can some Christians believe it? Well, William Lane Craig's theory would put it very very, if he's right on his view of Genesis, would open the whole idea of evolution in, in a very large scope, like including things like um, even you could have a biogenesis, universal common descent even, you could have that, um, I think. If you have his view of Genesis and some other related passages in the New Testament. Am I convinced of his view? No, but I'm, but I'm, but I had said all this to tell you guys, like, I understand the people who say, oh, I'm kind of on the fence a little bit on these issues. So I refuse to teach it openly and present like something you should believe about this passage because of my ignorance and my, my confusion, my unresolved questions about those issues, not my doubts for, let me just head you off at the pass here. Not my doubts about Genesis, not my doubts about scripture, my unresolved questions. I have unresolved questions about lots of passages and I don't teach those things because I'm not going to be a blind guide. But you're asking not what's true of the passage. You're asking how can some Christians believe that? Well, they, you can be a Christian who fully believes the Bible and you just think it, it works fine with evolution. You might be right. You might be wrong. But that category exists. And I would never say a Christian who believes in evolution is not a Christian or that someone has to reject evolution in order to be a Christian. Even though scientifically, let's set the Bible aside for a second, Scientifically, I don't affirm abiogenesis or universal common descent. I don't think they're scientifically true. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, I have spent a lot of time studying it. I'm aware that I could be ignorant of some issues there, but my opinion is that that's the case. Um, but I would not not say that a Christian who believes those things is not a Christian or that they don't believe the Bible. You, you At most, you could say they're misunderstanding some scriptures, but they still have confidence in Jesus. They still have the core of the faith intact, and they're still solidly Christian. Um I hope that answers your question. Let's go to the next one. Dalton Farmer says, Hey Mike, I had a debate with a friend about Israel still being God's chosen people. Doesn't Romans 9 verses 6 through 8 and Galatians 3, 28 and 29 communicate that God's chosen is anyone who places their faith in Jesus? So this is the old like uh, debate about what's called like replacement theology and whether or not it, current day Jews and Israel has like a plan for God nationally, not individually, right? But nationally. Okay. That's an interesting thing. So let's, 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 uh, let's consider this Romans nine, six through eight. Let's just look at these verses, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac, your offspring shall be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Okay, so this actually, it, it's less related, I think, to this topic than, than maybe people think. My, my opinion here, if you want to have me give you a more thorough answer, I actually have a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through Romans. I go through this in detail. I talk about replacement theology. So here's my off-the-cuff response. Um, this passage is not saying that non-Israelites are Israel. This passage isn't about that. This, these direct verses, it's saying everyone who's descended from Abraham isn't necessarily going to be inheriting the promise and be part of God's ultimate plan through, through Abraham. So it's limiting that within all of those who are blood descendants of Abraham, only those who are children of the promise or who have faith in ultimately the child of the promise, Christ, only them will be considered fully receivers of the promises of Abraham and salvation. 
So you can't just be a descendant of Abraham. You have to have faith in Jesus, I think is kind of the point there. Um, it doesn't say there that Gentiles are Israel. It just says not everyone who's descended from Abraham counts as that sort of promised people. Um, but your other passage, I'm not saying other passages don't talk about that, but that other passage is Galatians 3, 28, 29. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no fa- male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, now that's talking about it. That verse is talking about it. You you coupled these verses together well. That verse is definitely saying, hey, you know, we're like, hey, not everyone who's in Romans, not everybody who's descended from Abraham is a child of the promise. But if you're in Christ, Jew or Greek, whatever, you're an heir according to the promise. Yeah, th- this is, my current understanding of this is, it goes like this. In Christ, it's at the tree analogy that Paul gives. Um, those who are Jewish are part of the natural tree. And some of those branches could be broken off, even though they're descendants of Abraham, they don't have faith in Christ. And so they're not going to be part of the promise. Okay. So they're like branches broken off and Gentiles are grafted in, meaning we're not children of Abraham biologically, but we're grafted in and we become, you know, heirs of the promise, heirs according to the promise. So that the, the body of Christ then is, um, this tree that is in a sense, Jewish, and Gentiles are grafted in. Now, here's where I don't go with this. Here's what stops me from, from going full-on replacement theology with this. Like, I guess a few things. One is these Jews that are these Gentiles that are grafted in, they're never, they're not Jews. They're grafted in. They're heirs, according to the promise and all that. They're Abraham's offspring, right? But we're not actually Jewish in the in the sense, in the natural sense of you are now the Jews. Um the, instead inside of this tree, inside of Christ, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Greek. Okay, there's one nuance that I think helps a little bit there. Another nuance would be that God prophetically still has promises about physical Israel. And so even in uh, Romans, the chapter we were just in, where he talks about how not everybody is, but if you read on in Romans 10, he talks about all these Jews that are still around that aren't saved. My brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I bear them witness they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God, that's how we get saved, is God gives us his own righteousness, and he requires that kind of righteousness for us to be saved. And seeking to establish their own, they not, did not submit to God's righteousness. So, he wants them to all to be saved, and then Romans 11 He says this to help maybe clarify. There we go. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham. Okay, so the, there's still Jews in, in the kingdom. In fact, the apostles are all Jewish. The early church was initially largely Jewish. So it, so don't think it's God picks Gentiles over, over Jews here. The church isn't Gentile or Jew. The church is, here's, here's the conclusion, Gentile and Jew. That's why it's not this replacement theology, you, not them. But let's read on. There's there's another piece to the puzzle, I think. Um, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know the scripture says of Elijah how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I've kept my for myself 7,000 men who've not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. This idea of a remnant is that God won't be done with Israel because he's still doing a work and the remnant is evidence of that. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. I love that verse. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor and he goes on to explain like how this spiritually happened. But let's read on because this is prophetic now. So I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Verse 11, by no means. Rather, that through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. If God was done with Israel, why is God wanting to make Israel jealous? If, if, if we replace, if the church replaces Israel, Israel has no function anymore, except that we just are Israel, the church just is Israel, then who is this Israel that's being made jealous? There is a sense in which the church is like Israel, spiritually speaking, the fulfillment of Israel, but But God is still at work in Israel. 
as a real group of people that, that he has a plan for. Now, if the tr their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more their, will their full inclusion mean? Meaning these Israelites, if they get saved, great revival amongst the Jewish people. They turn to Jesus, they get saved. Now he's talking about um, God's future plan for Israel. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much as then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them, right? They're, they're still Israel. They're still Jews. They're, they're just not in Christ. So they're not inheriting the promise. They're, the physical things there and some of the prophetic futures there, but but not, not, the, not the, the joys, not the fullness of Christ. For if their rejection, verse 15, means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So this is like great revival in Israel, Israel revival. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some branch of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not be, become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And they, even if, if they do not, and even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, they're still the natural branches, they're still Israel, be grafted back into their own olive tree? There is a sense in which Israel is, is, is not Israel, and there's a sense in which Israel is Israel, and I think you have to have both of these. Replacement theology tends to ign ignore half of that story. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel partial until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and in this way all Israel will be saved so in the end times all you know in the final consummation I think all Israel will be the church which is natural Jews and grafted in Gentiles but that's not a replacement for God's work and promises for physical Israel today because there's a time coming when all Israel will be saved they will there will be a great revival they will come back you can read more, um, and uh, uh, my you know my Roman series gets into this in detail. I have a video that's kind of about replacement theology, so I'll I'll link that below the Roman series. You guys can check that out, and uh, just scroll through the the different videos. You can see there's one on Romans 11, there's one on Romans 9, there's a, several on Romans 9, Romans 10. Those are the that's the relevant section that we deal with that. Um, let's go to the next question. Duh, 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 duh. Evan Birkby says, thanks for your wonderful teaching, Pastor Mike. Oh, thank you, Evan. I'm I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged that you find it helpful. Um, are animals able to sin? They kill for food, and sometimes it appears this may be likened to murder, but what does the Bible say about this? Oh, man, that's an interesting question. I think I have to think about that more. Um I, I mean, I can say that, you know, animals killing for food is not seen as sin in the Bible, just like people killing for food is, is I mean, you're not killing people for food, right? But people killing other, killing animals for food, that's not seen as a sin in the Bible either. Um, um, there are times where like an ox, go, if you know, in the law, it says like, hey, if an ox gores somebody, somebody and it's known from the past that this ox gores people, you know, you'll stone it, you'll kill it. And, 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 and even the, the guy that, that controlled the ox, um, that owned it. That is, he knew his, his animal was dangerous and he didn't do anything about it. So he's responsible. So that would imply that there's a accountability. The, 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 for the, for what the animal did, the person is accountable. So what does that imply about the animal is that maybe they're not accountable in that sin sense, right? They need to be destroyed because they're dangerous, but are they accountable? It doesn't seem to be the case to me. I think most of us, 
there's just one passage of scripture that might weigh in on it. Um, there's a, for most of us, we, we naturally think of animals not as sinning when they do, even when they do bad things, even when you're like bad cat, bad cat, like it doesn't feel like it's in the category of sin that it is with humans. I'm speaking entirely of feelings and impressions here. Let that be known, <laughs> not scripture. Um, and so I, I recognize this means I have an inclination towards thinking even a bad animal that's, that behaves, misbehaves a lot where I'm not exactly thinking it's sinful in the same way I think a person is. Um, but it can't be denied that there are animals that do bad things. Like there are very bad things that just do these bad things over and over again. And it can, I understand if it can feel like they're actually sinning. Um, do they say, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you guys in the comments have more information on that or more thoughts on that. There's a couple thoughts from me. Um, you know, Maria says animals don't have souls. And, um, I think actually Ecclesiastes implies that they do have a soul, but that it, that it just goes down and they die. But then of course the meaning for soul could just be life there. Um, so maybe, maybe not the case. Um, I think they don't have eternal souls. That's my personal opinion about it. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, it, 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 this little question gets into what is the nature of an animal? What is the nature of an animal's psyche or soul or or spirit? Um, and what is the nature of what kind of moral accountability there is for an animal? Like these types of questions are interesting. And I don't know how to give you better answers yet. I'll think about it more. Uh, Ricky, Nell, Ricky Nicks Q says, no, <laughs> Ricky Nicks, and you have a question. That's the Q. All right, you say, uh, J J John Wesley says, you have one business on this earth to save souls. Is Christ likeness, spiritual maturity, chiefly a means to an end of bringing people to Christ? And you offer three verse references: Romans eight twenty nine, Second Corinthians three eighteen, and Second Peter three eighteen. So, the, so John Wesley sa is quoted as saying, "You have one business on this earth to save souls." Um. And you're like, hey, so it, does that mean all of our spiritual things that we do, it's just a means to an end, which is bringing other people to Christ? I I want to be be charitable to John Wesley here and, and suggest that maybe he meant it in a, in, a, in a more particular way than that. It might be that when he said you have one business on this earth to save souls, that what he was saying is um, all Christians have an occupation that, that encompasses the entire... Um, that encompasses our purpose while we're on this transitory earth. That is, this life is going to fade, we're going to pass on, and, you know, you have one major task, which is to bring other people to Jesus Christ. And and to, in my experience, uh, Christians at large, and myself too, uh, have de devalued or undervalued evangelism, deliberate evangelism and outreach. And that's pretty systemic, it seems, amongst Christians that we just do this across the board. Um, not every Christian does this, but rather you see it so much that I can understand a statement like that being needful. Like, hey, when you die and then you stand before God in heaven and then you, you were brought into glory in all eternity, how much are you going to care? How much are you going to care about most of the stuff you did on earth compared to that person next to you in heaven because you, say, you, you, you preach the gospel to them, you, you went to them and they ended up getting saved? I think that that's a good awareness, I, but I don't think we should take it too woodenly when he says you have one business on this earth to save souls. If I'm going to agree with that, I can't take it too woodenly. I could say you have amongst all the things you do on this earth, that which has the greatest impact and is, is of the greatest value eternally is leading someone else to Jesus. In other ways, you do things and there will be fruit in heaven for the things you do, but, but what compares to that? A soul is saved what compares to that? that that would be how i would put it um i wouldn't to take it woodenly if we take it woodenly and say well then i guess my christ likeness my spiritual maturity and all that is just a means to an end of saving souls that is definitely not the case biblically um we're to honor god and honoring god is a, is is the end like that i bring glory to god that i live pleasing to him that is an end in itself and even, so preaching the gospel nobody gets saved like, what if I'm unsuccessful? I keep preaching and preaching. Nobody gets saved. I honored God the whole way. He was glorified. So I've achieved an end. If um, saving souls was our our only purpose in, in that sense, in that wooden sense, then we wouldn't have Jesus's command to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength as the chief command. Love your neighbor as yourself as the second. 
It would just be evangelize. But it is the task of Christians to evangelize. Um, and it's one that we often have put on the back burner. Taylor Evans has a question. says, I have a son and had a domestic violence upbringing. I have fears of family telling me how to parent my son. How do I set healthy biblical boundaries that protect my son and honor Christ? Hmm. Taylor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just throw out some guesses here as I try to fill in the blanks a little bit on your story. Um, you, you, you have domestic violence in your background, which means that the parents or, or whoever was influencing you as you were growing up, they were, they were doing things wrong, right? And you're worried that they're going to think that you should do things wrong too and try to pressure you to do those wrong things in the way you raise your son or your child. Um, my, okay, my, my, my counsel, like in a sense, pastoral kind of counsel would be some of the following things. Um, start learning. And I mean, actually focus on this as a, as a task, as a mission, start learning how to have consistent, godly parenting, um, simple rules for the household and for your kids and, and, and all that and known ways of enforcing those rules that in, in, in foresight and in hindsight, you're like, that was not an overreaction. That was not an underreaction. That was a proper enforcing of the rule. You, you might be tempted and you'll be, you'll be shocked to, to see this, but you may, if you're no, like, it's just, just speaking pastorally here in, in my own life experience as a human, you might be shocked that some of the same stuff you hated that was done to you, it becomes your go-to reaction when you're the one in charge because you've learned behaviors you didn't realize you were being watching these patterns and then you just naturally go down the same path so you you can't go down the same path of um this domestic violence of various kinds where i'm, I'm going to be using verbal or, or emotional or, or physical abuse but you also can't go down the passive path where it's like i will give my kid here's, here's the thing i will give my kid the childhood that i wanted when i was a child because the childhood you wanted when you were a child was an unhealthy, uh, self-indulgent, zero consequences, do whatever you want childhood. Everybody wants that because we're all selfish little nerds when, it, when you get down to it. And so you can't give your kid the childhood you wanted. You, you need to try to give them the childhood they need and godly parenting where you have, you know, read the book of Proverbs and, and think of how to apply this in your parenting because there's a lot of parenting advice in the book of Proverbs. Maybe read some parenting books, even get them on Audible if you don't like, or just start YouTubing it and look at, but don't just listen to one source here, listen to multiple and start to craft what becomes a consistent and reliable parenting plan for how you will deal with these things. The reason why I say all this is because when you're really confident about like how you should parent, you don't become reactionary to the advice of others. You, you might weigh it, you might think about it, but you're not reactionary. Because you're not just parenting off your gut all the time. You're parenting with a structure and a plan that is reliable for your kid. They need reliable stuff if they're going to feel like there's a stable world around them. Where they do this, they know this will happen. Um, and they don't have to look at your face to see how angry you are to decide whether they'll get in trouble or not when they're about to do something they shouldn't. So these are just some, some things I recommend. Yeah, um, look at the parenting teachings in the book of Proverbs. Right, You can't not discipline your kid. If you, if you, if you don't punish them, Proverbs says you hate your son. If you don't punish him when he does bad things, but if you over punish, you're a brute, you're, you're cruel and you're abusive. So you got to find that balance. Um, anyway, that's, it's a tough, tough thing. The last thing I'd say is, um, involve yourself if possible in small group settings in church where you have other parents that are there and you can talk to godly people like where you're, you're like, well, they seem like they got it together. And, and talk to them about the parenting issues you have and ask them what advice they have. That's another great, great thing to do. Uh, number seven, let's go to Fisk, who says, how do I read the Old Testament without getting bored and distracted two minutes in? Um, here's a better idea, Fisk. Read it anyways, even when you're bored and distracted. You... I'm brutal honesty, Fisk. I know you want honesty from me and it comes from a place of love. Okay. Your tolerance 
for that which is not entertaining is very low. You need to expand that tolerance. Now, I could tell you, study the passage deeply, and then you will you will see the rewarding and you you know the beautiful things that are in the passage, and you will go, wow, this is so much more entertaining than I thought it was. But you'll never get there unless you expand your tolerance for not being entertained. You're like two minutes in, I'm bored and distracted. Like that's because the muscle that is thinking without being entertained is emaciated. Okay, so like you gotta just push yourself and force yourself and. So that could be setting an environment where you can actually read and think carefully and you're getting, you know, into it in a lot of like focus, but so you may, maybe there's no sound or maybe you, you only like sometimes when I'm having a really hard time focusing. I'll put on Bach or, um, or, uh, Chopin. I really like Chopin a lot. So there's like this big fat playlist of Chopin music. I'll put that on and, and listen to it. And, and it, it actually helps me focus. Someone else would get distracted by that. Find the things that help you focus. Take your phone, put it in some other location, get the Bible out, decide ahead of time, I'm going to read this much, get your pencil out, I'm going to underline interesting bits, I'm going to summarize what I've read in a few words on the side or in a notepad, and then I'm going to do that every day. Th that is how you start to, to strengthen that muscle, and all of a sudden you will find, may take weeks, you will be like, hey, I, I can read more. And it doesn't have to be all entertaining to me. And I'm more focused because I've practiced myself being focused. It's very deliberate. You have to do it very much on purpose. I've always struggled with this personally. And so I've learned lots of tricks and things to do to try to like keep myself focused. Um, Cause I have to study for long periods of time. Like if, if you had told me when I was a kid or even, even in my twenties, I, I should say if I was like 20 years old, if you told me at the age of 20, Mike, you're going to basically study for a living where you just read and read boring, otherwise boring material. A lot of times it is, um, especially when I'm doing projects like women in ministry. <laughs> um, I would have been like, oh no, that sounds bad. That sounds real bad because it's just, it's not something I'm inclined to do. You build that muscle over time. Major Cajun has a question. What makes a servant worthwhile to Christ? It seems like in Matthew 25, the servant was cast into outer darkness because he did not do enough. Um, well, I, let me say, I just feel a little bit like trappy about, and not, not that you're meeting this, but the question, what makes a servant worthwhile to Christ is pretty one dimensional by that. I mean, a, a servant that's cast out because they were a worthless servant. We'll look at that word in a second. Um, doesn't mean that that servant has no value in any way, shape or form. Like they're still made in the image of God. They're, they're valuable in which they they have all the potential to do all the things that Jesus wants them to do. They just choose not to, which means they produce no value in their life. It doesn't mean that they actually have no value. So I just want to make sure that there's a distinction there. Um, they have all the potential. They didn't have any of the actuality because they chose not to do it. And so I just want to make that distinction for those that might need to hear it. Uh, Matthew 25. Let's look at the parable. We're going to read a big chunk of scripture here and try to answer the question. Um, it seems like the servant was cast to outer, into, into outer darkness because of, he didn't, he didn't work enough. You know, what makes it, what makes you worthwhile to cry? What, what makes you not get cast out? <laughs> Maybe here's a question. Um, all right. Matthew 25 verse one. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps. Oh, hold on. Verse one. Uh, and yeah, I think it's a parable of the talents. Just making sure I don't want to read the whole thing. Okay. Um, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once. By the way, a talent is just a very large amount of money. So talent is not here referring to skills, although often we kind of parallel it that way, probably because in the English it just happens. In other language, the word talent does not happen to sound like skills <laughs> and abilities. Um, so I don't want to lean on that too heavily, considering that most people throughout history were not reading the Bible in English. Um, so he received the five talents, went at once and traded. Um, oh, let me highlight this. Each according to his ability. So these guys were fully capable 
of taking this amount of money and handling it well. Okay, they, they had the ability to do it. So he gives them different talents according to their abilities, different amounts of money according to their abilities. Then he went away. He who received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. Double. That's a huge increase. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. He effectively had the same increase. But he who had received the one talent went and dug into the ground and hid his master's money. What do you guys think about that? Is this a guy that tried and just didn't work? He just didn't work hard enough. This is a guy that abandoned the task. He abandoned the task. He went to go live his own life, have his own good times, and he just completely abandoned the task. I buried it in the ground. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants, and there is his servants, they, but they owe him service, and came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you've delivered to me five talents here. I made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. This now feels very much like a second coming thing, where Jesus is talking about like when some sort of judgment time comes and you're like entering into the kingdom, this is how it feels in this parable. Um, and so the master seems to be Jesus. And, and then who are these servants? Well, those who owe Jesus service. And he also, who had the two, uh, he also who had the two talents came forward saying, master, you delivered to me two talents here. I've made you two talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. Now keep in mind, this guy had one talent, probably because he just wasn't as skilled as the other guys. And he seemed to use that excuse as to act like he had no skill. So he buries it in the ground. His pretend reason is... I was afraid I'd lose your money. I was afraid I'd lose it. I was afraid I'd make bad decisions and I would actually cause harm. So I hit it. But there's more to the story. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. How does he, what does he call him? Wicked, right? Wicked because he wanted to pursue his own goals, his own things. So he's actually sinning. He's not just failing to do good works. He's actually sinning. And he's slothful because he's lazy, um, doesn't want to be diligent, doesn't want to serve and, and use what God has given him. You knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've scattered no seed. So what, what, what could he have done? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And in my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. He would have at least had... The guy didn't do something safe with the money, even something easy. Here, bankers, take the money. I'll live my life and there's profits coming in at least. You know, He buried it and hid it, which was like a denial of his role, a denial of his call, a denial of his task. So he's not a Christian who performs poorly. This is a man who denies the lordship of Jesus in his life through his actions. I'm just going to, I'm going to live my own life and bury it. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away and cast the worthless servant into outer dark, the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That outer darkness appears to be, uh, you know, seems like it's it, it, it's safe to say the outer darkness here is like, you're not saved. Um, let me say this. Uh, there's obviously a debate to be had about whether the guy was ever saved. He was a servant of Jesus. Okay, but technically everybody should be serving Jesus. He is Lord of all. So we, but we, we can have that debate. I'm not going to try to have that debate because I don't know all the answers there. But... Um, when, you, when we ask the question of why was he cast into outer darkness, it's not just because he didn't do enough. It's because instead of doing anything for Christ, he actually buried that call and went and lived his own wicked and lazy life. So the dude lived functionally as a complete non-Christian. He didn't just fail to do enough. He actually did wickedness and did nothing positive. That's, that's the parable there. So I think that might help bring some... Resolution, some feelings you might have there, I hope. Madison says, hi, Mike. I'm struggling to interpret Judges 19, verse 2 and 25, uh, on why the concubine suffered abuse. Some have said God was punishing her for adultery. How do I understand this without reading into the text? You know, I, I taught Judges a while back. 
I say a while back, as soon as I do this, I'll be like the other day. And I'm thinking of something that happened like eight months ago. This a while back was like 16 years ago. And I, 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 one of the first books I'd really taught, I taught the book of judges and, um, I remember this passage. I mean, I've looked at it since then, of course, as well, but this is where in the book of judges, the further you get in the book of judges, like the more wicked everybody gets. And we're used to reading stories where you read about Daniel and the lion's den and you're looking for a hero and you're like, Daniel's the hero. <clears throat> you read about Elijah, Elijah's the hero, right? I read about these different guys, Jeremiah, Jeremiah's the hero, or at least the closest thing we have to a hero in these stories. Often you're like finding a hero. Judges starts to like subvert this because we have heroes that are flawed in other parts of the Bible, but here in Judges, you just have times where there's like no heroes at all, right? Like Samson's a deeply flawed sort of hero, right? Um, Jephthah, he's a, a deeply flawed hero, right? The further his story gets, the worse it gets. The beginning is like, ah, oh, hero. And then it's like, oh, what are you doing? You're a horrible person. Um, like Samson. Um, then you've got Gideon, who's a deeply flawed later in his life, hero earlier in his life. But Judges 19, it's like, no, nope, they're all losers. And that, I think, is your interpretive grid for Judges 19. Let's read the passage. <clears throat> when I think biblically about everything, well, that requires reading biblically I mean, while reading the Bible and drinking water. Do you guys notice my cat picture? I took that picture like right before the stream. I was just walking around the house looking for, <laughs> with this little Bible thinker note, biblethinker.org you know, reminder, and then um, looking for a cat. And I, I found a... Uh, Mika and she happened to yawn when I was doing it. She never shows up, rarely shows up for a stream. Of course, they both rarely show up nowadays for whatever reason. They don't, they don't like you guys. But I thought it was fun. Okay, let's read through this passage and then we'll talk about the story. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Okay, that's not, um, this is before the time of Saul, before the time of David and all that. A certain Levite who was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim. And you might be like, oh, he's the hero. No who took, the, him, took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. So uh, someone who has, basically, he sleeps with her, but she doesn't have the, the full rights of a wife. Okay, is this a good thing? No, it's a bad thing. He's not a good guy. And his concubine was unfaithful to him, as if he was faithful to her. But he, he, she was unfaithful to him. And she went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there some four months. So, so the plot begins. He's, he's this Levite. He's like, I'm going to go, go back and get my concubine back. She's been unfaithful to me. I'm going to go get her back. So then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He's going to talk her into return. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys. And she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And then there's this weird story. The father and, and, the, and, the, and the Levite. <clears throat> and his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay. And he, he remained with him three days. What are you going to insist he, you won't? So he stays there for three days. So they ate and drank and spent the night there. And on the fourth day, they arose early in the morning and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread. And after that, you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. Okay, the drinking part's relevant here. And the girl's father said to the man, be pleased to spend the night and let your heart be merry. So they're kind of getting, it looks like they're sort of drinking a lot together and they're just doing this day and night, you know, and, and this is why I think what happens, for, I, I, you know, for people who have like their drinking buddies, there's probably, you know, some drinking buddies who you're like, if I drink with that guy, it, it's, they're always drinking too much. Let's just say, um, and I think that that could be what's part of what's going on there. So, and when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him till he spent the night again. So he's now getting pushed to where he's like, I'm getting out of here, right? So on the fifth day, he arose early in the morning to depart. And the girl's father said, strengthen your heart and wait until the day declines. So they ate both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father said to him, behold, now the day has waned toward evening. Please spend the night. So in, in the mornings, he tells him, let's just have a little meal before you go. And then he's like, oh, you don't want to leave this late. Just stay the night. And so he keeps doing this to him. Um, please spend the night. Behold, the day's draws to its close. Lodge here and let your heart be merry. And tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. But the man would not spend the night. All that was, I'm sure there's other reasons for it, but all that was partly to set up the stage where the guy's going to leave at a bad time. Uh, you know, traveling in the wild at this time in Israel is not exactly safe. 
The judges is a wild and reckless time. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. There's chaos going on in different places. So traveling early in the morning during the day is much safer. You don't want to leave late, but he's going to do it anyways. Why did he do it? Because of this whole rigmarole where he was kept getting pushed into staying late. So the man would not spend the night. He rose up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus the day before, um, or sorry, the day was nearly over and the servant said to his master, come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. This is before the Jerusalem is the Jewish capital and all that. And his master said to him, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel. This is an interesting setup. Yeah, you're getting a whole study on this passage. An interesting setup because he's like, oh no, we're not going to trust these these non-Israelites. We're going to go over to the Israelites. That's where we'll be safe. There are people and they should be safe. And this should be something he can rely on, but he can't because Israel is in rebellion against God. Israel's bad. Everyone's bad. The end of Judges is bad or reveals everyone's bad. It's kind of showing dep the depravity of man. But we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or at Ramah. So they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. That is the tribe of Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city. This is kind of a way of saying, hey, I'm a visitor. I'm a tourist. I need somewhere to stay. But no one takes him into his house to spend the night. Verse 16. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was sojourning in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites. <clears throat> and he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and where do you come from? And he said, we are passing from Bethlehem in Judah. Here we go. To the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah and I'm going to the house of the Lord, but no one has taken me into his house. We have straw and feed for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and your female servants and young man. So we're not going to need any of your stuff. We just need a place to stay. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, peace be to you. I will care for all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. How does that sound familiar? That sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah. You don't stay out here. Come to my house. This is dangerous place. And I think that's part of the point. So he brought them into his house and gave the donkeys feed and they washed their feet, ate and drank and they were making their hearts merry. Behold, the men of the city, worthless fellows surrounded this, the house beating on the door. That sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah too, doesn't it? And they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring the man who came into your house that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house went out to them and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so, know him as they may sexually abuse him. Do not act so wickedly since this man has come into my house. Do not do this vile thing. Behold, here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. That sounds like a lot too. Now you may not think that's a good idea. I don't think it was a good idea, but it's just telling you this is what happened. Uh, I'm going to suggest maybe don't look for heroes right now. Just read what happened. Let me bring them out now, violate them and do with them what seems good to you. But against this man, do not do this outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and made her go out to them. Again, this is against her will. He seized her and made her go out. She's not even like offering self-sacrificially or something like that, right? This is this is uh, done. Uh, and they knew her and abused her all night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. Heartbreaking, horrific, evil, sick, wicked, and it just gets worse. And as morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where his master was until it was light. And her master rose up in the morning and when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. So she's she's lying there with her hands on the threshold, meaning even when they dis discarded her, she was still alive, right? And she, she goes to the door to get in and they're like sleeping or something. They don't let her in. They don't... It's okay if you feel mad about these guys. I do. <laughs> Um, and her master rose up in the morning when he opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. Behold, there was his concubine lying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man rose up and went his way to, away to his home. And when he entered his house, he took a knife. 
Parental discretion advised. There was your warning. He took a knife and taking hold of his concubine, he divided her limb by limb into 12 pieces and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. I personally think that she was already dead. Um, and he cuts her into pieces, sends her out throughout Israel. And all who saw it, pieces of her, like probably with, with notes saying, this, this happened in Gibeah. Look at what they did in Gibeah. Look at the horrible thing that Gibeah did. He's calling out for justice is what he's doing. Um, he's offering evidence, which is, it was not meant to look, feel like a serial killer type thing, but it was gruesome, but it was also evidence that he was offering. And all who saw it said, such a thing's never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt till this day. Consider it to counsel and speak. Then, short version, chapter 30, Israel gathers together and goes to war with the tribe of Benjamin because of this, and they all slaughter each other, and they kill so much of Benjamin that they're almost like out of people, almost eradicates the tribe of Benjamin because they've overreacted, because this is what people do in a chaotic society. Even when they do find evil, they sometimes overreact, and they want to destroy everybody who can even be said to be associated with that. Like, I don't know, race wars, <laughs> like that kind of thing. So here's tribe wars. Um, okay, now to your question. Uh, I'm struggling to interpret this passage, right, on why the concubine suffered abuse. Um, some have said God was punishing her for adultery. How do I understand this without reading into the text? I, I think you probably know my answer already. My answer is um, the concubine is one of the things that's clear about the passage. Uh, of course, I say that don't look for good guys because you're not going to find them here. Um, but one thing that's clear about the passage is that what was done to the concubine was wrong. That seems to be very clear, right? They're shocked. They say in verse 30 of Judges 19, such a thing has never happened or been seen. It's clearly meant to be a parallel to Sodom and Gomorrah, where what was done there was evil, right? And, and so it's, it's, it's something that was done that was wrong to her. She, she was wrong, uh, for sure. So yeah, was she being punished for some sin that she committed? That's completely fabricated. If you want to say that, well, she did. She did cheat on him. I'm like, okay. Um, but where does the text say that this is a causal? That this is something God visited his judgment upon her in this way? It doesn't say that. Actually, I think the if you look at Judges, you back up and you zoom and you look at the passage in the context of, of Judges as a whole, what you see is God is showing how wicked Israel was. In the book of Judges, like um, the trajectory of Revelation, right? In the book of Judges, we, we see that the, the the people of Israel have been called out. God gave them his perfect laws. He then gives them, in the book of Judges, gives them the land, which they don't even clear out properly because of their own unbelief and their own inactivity. And then they, with God, with the land that God has promised, with the laws that God has given, the perfect laws, they still fail so, so much. And it's meant to point to the, ineff the ineffectiveness of the law to bring people salvation or to, or to make the perfect society. Jesus is what's needed. All of the the anguish and the discontent and the like, what is going on that you feel towards judges or throughout the Old Testament is meant to point to how man fails and where Jesus will succeed and how it drives us to the cross. We need Jesus. I think that's the point. Um, so yeah. Number 10. Um, Isaac W. says... I've been asked, was Adam's sin the first sin? Something along the lines of, wasn't Satan the first one that sinned? Thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, Satan it was the first one that sinned. I don't know. It's pretty simple, right? Um, uh, Satan tempted Eve. If tempting others to sin is not a sin, <laughs> then what? What? what is? Um, so, yeah, uh, Satan lied. He deceived and in addition to that, Eve sinned and Eve sinned before Adam did. So Eve also sinned before Adam. So your question is, Hey, was Adam sin the first sin? The answer is no, but Adam is the representative of mankind. Eve is not. There's a sense in which Eve represents women in general, but, but biblically speaking, Adam is the one who stands to represent us all when he eats. We all fall down. We all fall with him. And so Adam eating is is the is the the conduit through which sin infects man mankind. Maybe I could put it that way. Whereas the serpent sinning didn't do that. Eve sinning didn't do that. Adam sinning did. 
that that's how I think the theology of that goes. And so Adam's, when we say original sin, well, we don't necessarily mean the first sin that ever happened. We're talking about how sin brought in, was, was brought in to infect mankind. And that was Adam. I think hopefully that brings clarity there. Christina Haar says, what does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Is that a literal statement? Thank you for your ministry, Mike. It's so appreciated and needed. Oh, thank you very much. I think it's needed too. That's why I do it. Um, so let's look at that passage in Philippians. Um, oh, what did I just do? Um, <clears throat> here we go. So Philippians 2.12, and we'll get it up on your guys' screen. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think in English, we can point this out that um, work out doesn't mean work for. I mean, if Paul said work for your own salvation, that would be very different. And that would be like, I'd be making a face like my cat is right below there. Um, work for your own salvation. Um, work out your own salvation. So that word, I wonder if I could bring it up. Let me hazard an attempt to bring up some Greek. And see if this will prove fruitful. Um, I think you guys can see that on your screens there. Um, Katergazomai. Um so one of the meanings is to bring about a result by doing something to achieve or accomplish something. Number two, another definition, uh, to cause a state or condition, bring about or produce or create. To cause to be well prepared, to be successful in the face of obstacles. Um, oh man, this is a problem with hazarding your, your without doing all the research ahead of time. I can't scan through all this stuff right now. I know you guys are all interested in the Greek stuff, but the, the recklessness of just doing it off the cuff is not, is not as helpful as a larger explanation. Here's what I'll do. Um, I will take this question because I think it's worthwhile and I think I, I'll bring confusion if I, if I don't do this right. I'll take this question next week, next, next week. Yeah, I'll take this one next week. I will take this one next week. I'll take it as the first question for next week. I was going to do a non-Christian Q&A next week, or not next week, but next time. We'll do it two times from now. We'll do a non-Christian Q&A. But next time, which is two weeks from today, we will do working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I'll do a teaching on it that I think will be more thorough and I'll be able to prepare better because I, I just want to be cautious and that I don't say something that's unhelpful. All right. Number 12, Benji Ahuji says, is nepotism a sin? Uh, my church was founded by my grandma. My dad is the senior pastor and my brother is a youth leader. I do believe they legitimately earn these roles, but others at my church don't. Um, I'm not sure. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about how, I wonder if I could turn this up a little bit. See if we hear that in the, in the video. Would you guys let me know if you hear the fan, if I make it a little bit louder. You've got to hear that. I don't know. Let me know if you hear that in the, in the live chat. I'll look. Um, I was thinking about this recently, the issue of nepotism. And I, I, I think that we overreact to it. <laughs> I do. Now, I, I don't have any, any thing like that going on that I'm like ashamed of or something like that. Um, and I've never had a job or something like that because of who my parents are. Um, so I'm not like relying on it in some sense, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's, it's, it's all bad. Okay. So I'm just gonna put it that way. I'm not sure that it's all bad when you say nepotism or, or like, say you have two equally qualified candidates for a job and one of them is your son and one of them's not. I'm not, I don't, I don't know why it's wrong to pick your son. Now, if you have, um, your son's underqualified 
and you put him into that position anyways, that would be a, a negative. So when I say, I don't think nepotism is always wrong. Okay. Don't think you hear any fan. Good. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Glad to hear it. Cause I could do, it's getting so warm in this room. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's just a hot day out. I have to, haven't dialed in exactly how I'm doing all this stuff. Thanks chat. I, I see you. I hear you. Okay. So I, I, I'm asking my personal opinion, and then I'm going to talk about some scripture in a minute. Um, so my personal opinion is nepotism is not inherently wrong. It can be wrong. And when it can be wrong is when you give people positions that they shouldn't have. Like, this is the wrong person for this job, but they have it merely because of a relation or favoritism of some kind. Um, now, th that would be to me where, where, I, where I would say there's a problem. So nepotism that is effectively, oh, yes. This person who I'm related to is just as qualified as this other person over here, or at least they can sufficiently do the job and I'm going to prefer them over this person. And I'm like, I don't know that that's all that wrong. Um, because in scripture, we do have a lot of familial connections. So we, we have people being appointed to do things because they're genetically related to other people. Like the, the kingships of Israel is a genetic thing. So when David appointed Solomon instead of somebody else, instead of like some total stranger who just would, would have been maybe a good king, you could call that nepotism. And so if you're completely anti-nepotism, I think that that makes, that's going to, that's going to be hard to be consistent with saying that like Solomon was the right man for the job because he admits that he's incapable David calls him like a child, effectively, as he's, as he's putting him in there. Like, he just got in because he's related. Like, that's his the genetics was important there. Um, the appointment of, um, of the high priests in Israel and of the priesthood in Israel was entirely nepotistic. Is that a word? <laughs> um, because all of the Levites were to be the priests. And it was entirely because of what the Levites had done long, long ago when Israel was was moving towards apostasy and um, the golden calf incident and the Levites rallied towards towards God, right? And so they become the tribe that produces all the priests of Israel. Is that nepotism? Like in a very big sense, it, it's like a big giant chunk of nepotism. But is that bad? I don't think it's bad in that scenario. So, so I just think we have to have some nuance that's going on there. So if you have a church where you've got, um, you know, a bunch of family and they're all in ministry. Um, I, I, I'm not in, I don't automatically think there's a problem there. Oh, the pastor is, 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 is this guy and his son is the associate pastor and his daughter's running the children's ministry stuff. And then, you know, his, his wife is, is, does the accounting. Well, are they good at it? <laughs> like, that's the question I'd have. Are they capable? Are they, you know, can they sustain the job well, they do a good job. And if the answer is that they're doing a good job, great. But if they're disqualified, if they're doing a bad job and they shouldn't be there and they're only in because they're related, then then it's a, a, a negative nepotism problem. But really, I'll put it this way. Ignore the nepotism for a second. Ignore the fact that they're related and just ask, if they weren't related, would they still have this job? Um, and that, that might give you a clue. But you got to be careful when you're trying to evaluate whether you think the people in ministry at your church deserve the job and the role that they have and how well you think they do. Um, it's, let me just speak openly about this for a minute. As, as a pastor, you learn, and, and even more so now with online ministry stuff, there are so many eyeballs on you. And, and I don't want to woe is me here. And pastors, you got to be careful that you don't, you don't take this the wrong way and I'm not giving you an excuse to get all woe is me. And we have to be really thick skinned and tough about things um, and not give ourselves space to be crybabies. That said, um, you'd be surprised how many people are not only critical of you at, at being in ministry because you're, you're very visible. A lot of people are aware of you. A lot of people are aware of what you're doing or they think they're aware of what you're doing. So as a youth pastor, I would be doing things in youth ministry, spending all my time and all my energy and all my blood, sweat, and tears for youth ministry. And I had people in the congregation who sometimes would judge my effectiveness in youth ministry. They had never been in the youth ministry. They had never talked to me about youth ministry, but they had firm opinions about how effective I was at that ministry, about whether I should even be there or not. 
They had firm opinions about what I taught in youth ministry. They had never heard me teach in youth ministry. And so um, just be cautious that because you're familiar with a person doesn't mean you're actually really familiar with their ministry. Because you see a person, they're visible, doesn't mean that you're in a place to make a judgment call on on whether they belong there or not, or, or if it's nepotism or not. I'm just saying be gracious, be cautious, be slow to make a judgment call and things like that. That just seems wise. Um, you know. All right, let's see. Uncle Nick says, can someone repent after death? Um, Hebrews 9.27 seems to say no, but Revelation 20. Two verses 21 through 27 seems to suggest, yes, for it is the unwillingness to repent that condemns. I really hope the latter is true. Hi, Moxie. Okay. Uncle, he says hi to Moxie. All right. Um, Hebrews 9, 27. We'll look at this one first. And let me say this, this, this issue is bigger than these two verses, these two passages we're going to look at. Um, it's a lot bigger than just the two. So you won't find your whole answer here. I'm just going to talk about how these two weigh in. I will say off the cuff that I do not think you get a chance to repent after death. I don't think there's any evidence of that. And I think there seems to be support against it in scripture. That seems pretty solid to me. Um, so Hebrews 9 27 says, just as it is appointed for man to die once. And after that comes judgment. So Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who eagerly are waiting for him. So that phrase, it's appointed a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Um, to be honest, it does not say immediately after that comes judgment. It doesn't say that. So after that comes judgment, could could it be that everyone dies and then judgment comes sometime after? Maybe it has nothing to do with the timing of whether someone can repent after death. Um, so that that would seem to be not super relevant. Now, I, as a younger Christian, I used this verse for the same purpose. It was, it was somebody who believed that you could repent after death that pointed that out. So after you die, you get judged. It doesn't say that it happens right that second. And on a, a premillennial view, which I am premill, I'm like, yeah, well, there is a final judgment that comes like way after we die. So there's like a, t- a, a temporary judgment and then a final judgment. Um, so I don't think that verse actually directly relates to the issue, to be honest. I have to agree with them, even though I disagree with their conclusions on the topic. Revelation 2.21 um, says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. This, let me back up just a little bit. So <clears throat> in the letter, uh, which letter is this? The letter to Thyatira. He says, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed. He's going to punish her with illness. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches, and her children are those who are her followers here, right? Not her physical children, I I don't believe. Um, Who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Um, And how far did you go? To verse 27. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have till I come. The one who conquers and keeps my word until the end to him I will give authority over the nations, and he who will re- he will rule them with a rod of iron, as when the earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning start. And it goes on uh, beyond what you quoted. Um, I'll be honest, I'm struggling to think of even a way in which this passage could affirm that someone can repent after death. So he says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent. So he's going to do what? Throw her under a sick bed? Cast those into great tribulation unless they repent? And they'll be stricken dead. It doesn't say they can repent after death. There's nothing. uh, I I don't see it here. Any hint of any after death opportunity to repent. This all seems to be like now's the time to repent and it's a limited time. You better do it now or you're going to die is at least for those who are the followers of her stuff. 
Um, so yeah, I'm thinking this doesn't support the repent after death view. There's other scriptures that should be brought into this. And I, I can only think of, let me just think of one off the top of my head, which is Jesus's parable about Lazarus and the rich man. They both die and they're both immediately sequestered into two very different locations in what the text calls in the Greek Hades. And so you have Abraham's bosom, which is this place of comfort for the saved. And then you have the unsaved, the rich man. And he's in a place of torment. Now he's immediately in a place of torment. And this isn't our final home where he's, it, the text calls it Abraham's bosom. That's, I'm speaking like King James style here. Abraham's comfort, maybe we can call it that. Abraham, he's he's there with Abraham, the same place Abraham died. Abraham, the model of faith, right? So he dies and goes, goes to good place, right? And then the rich man dies and goes to bad place. That happens immediately upon death. And the rich man is actually, this is a perfect opportunity for Jesus to teach that you can repent after you die because the rich man's like, woe is me. I can't believe I've been this way. Oh, I'm tormented now. I feel bad. And he says, please send Lazarus back to tell my brothers and warn them so they won't come to this place. There's no hope for that guy to change his fate now. The only hope is for the people that are still alive. So this parable um, while it's not directly about whether you can repent after you're saved, it seems to depend on the idea that you can't. There's one example of a scripture that I think, since neither of these seem relevant, terribly relevant to the topic, I, I, there's one that I think is more relevant. Yeah, let's um, go to the next question. Anonymous question. I was talking to an atheist and they asked if Adam had, I promise you guys, that was my belt on the chair, not some weird noise if you happen to hear that, <laughs> not some other sound. Um, I was talking to an atheist and they asked, if Adam had not yet eaten the tree of knowledge, eaten of the tree of knowledge, therefore not knowing disobedience, how can God hold him accountable and judge him for it? Checkmate, Christians. Um, yeah, so this is, I, I, love, I love questions like this. Okay. We get trick questions, and it is a trick question, right? We, we get trick questions all the time. This question is meant to say that there is a plot hole in the garden story. In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the story of the fall of man, there's a big plot hole. And the plot hole is, when Adam ate of the tree, he didn't even know that it was wrong because he didn't know good and evil. Bum, 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 plot hole. Um, so yes, there are lots of non-believers who think that the, the Bible has more plot holes and contrivances than the Rings of Power TV show. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it it, it doesn't. <laughs> well, the Rings of Power TV show does. Um, sorry, it's all Lord of the Rings right here, right? This is what I'm talking about. The Mordor fun run. One does not simply walk. Um, but not Rings of Power. Rings of contrivances and pretty cinematography and bad writing, but that has nothing to do with my ministry. So I'll move on. <laughs> um, so if, if, yeah, how could Adam know that he shouldn't eat and that it was bad, that it was morally wrong to eat if he didn't know good and evil? I think that the easy response is to say that the phrase knowledge of good and evil doesn't mean in a wooden and super strict sense knows nothing at all about the concept of moral right or wrongness. So let me let me put it to you this way. Those of you who've never done drugs, you don't have the knowledge of drugs. Those of you who've never done the gangbang lifestyle, you don't know the gangbang lifestyle. Adam and Eve did not know good and evil in that experiential sense, as you don't, you perhaps don't know drugs or don't know the gangbanger lifestyle, um, or, or I don't know what the adulterous lifestyle of cheating on your wife is like, right? Like I haven't done that. I don't know that doesn't mean I don't understand at least the concept of it linguistically. I'm able to communicate it or, or, or even more, even more than Adam, we actually know more about the gangbanger lifestyle than Adam would have, even if you haven't committed it because you've seen examples of it, right? Adam understood the concept of don't eat this tree. God told him, don't do it. You're not allowed to do that, right? He knew it was wrong, right? As Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, like Adam was not deceived. And he knew this was wrong. Eve was deceived. He actually knew it was wrong and did it anyway. So he had that moral knowledge. The Bible affirms Adam had that moral information. But Adam was living before this in a world where he had never done wrong. He had never seen anyone do wrong. And it was just 
moral innocence and perfection. When Adam sinned, he became aware of sin in the deeper way of the person who goes, now I know what it's like to, to go through this horrible experience. Now I know what, um, what, what the intimate knowledge of, of, of rebellion against God feels like and seeing it in others and, and seeing it in myself. So I think that's the answer is that we just don't take it. We don't take the knowledge of good and evil so woodenly. So an example of a religion that does this, that takes the knowledge of evil really woodenly is uh, Mormonism. In Mormonism, they'll believe that they, they're taught that uh, Adam and Eve, that the, the one of the reasons they had to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was because they never would have been able to fulfill God's command to be fruitful and multiply unless they ate of the tree. How do they get there? How do they get there that the tree was required in order for them to have babies? Because they think that included in that knowledge of good and evil is the knowledge of how intercourse works. And so in order for them to know how to do those things, they had to eat of the tree so that really God needed them to do it, to even fulfill his own commands to them. It's a weird thing and it's connected to other weird things. Mormonism is 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 in all ways a distortion, a taking of what, what is biblical, what is Christian, and then altering it, cutting pieces out, adding other things, distorting the meaning of things. Um, and there's one example of it that uh, is is strange and shocking um, and not biblical. All right, let's go to question 15. Holy Noel says, what do you think the waters above the expanse are in Genesis 1, 6 through 8? Oh, I like this question. Here's I'm going to get controversial on you. You might not realize this is controversial, but the comments section later on will demonstrate it. <laughs> I, I imagine. So God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. What is this? So there's a huge debate on the word for expanse there, rakia, which I take to, I take this translation to be accurate, expanse. There's a whole big controversy there because they're like, no, it's a hard fixed structure of some kind. Um, and there are those who would say that the waters above the expanse are actual physical windows or actual physical barrier and uh, the expanse is the barrier and above this barrier that space was viewed as just all liquid, like space above the, the out, outside the earth's atmosphere. So you have earth, you have sky, you got clouds and you have this hard firmament, right? That, that's, that's not an expanse. It's a hard firmament. And above that you have waters, large amounts of water that are up here, these celestial waters. And that when the flood came, God says, open the windows of heaven, it literally open these, shing, opens this kind of like portals, windows so that the water can splash down. Um, now I get into some of this in my video on the flat earth stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll link it down below on why the Bible does not support a flat earth. Now we talk about the waters above the expanse. I think that simply speaking, you would, you're, you imagine you're in ancient Israel. You're just looking around, like pretend that you don't know for, for, for a fact that ancient people all believed the earth was flat and ancient people all believed that there was a physical, you know, firmament that was, but just pretend you're just standing in a field and you don't know any of that. And you read this passage, right? There's an ex there, there's there's um, the earth, and then there's the water, and there's the dry there's a dry ground because the water and the earth are separated from each other. So there's dry ground, there's water. Then there's an expanse. There's waters below the expanse. That's that water he just talked about. And there's waters above the expanse. And you look up in the sky. What do you see? Clouds. <laughs> so I think clouds is the answer. It's not much more than that. The windows of heaven, all this stuff, it just refers to the water in the sky. You know, when you talk about water in the sky, rather than thinking of this solid firmament and these mystical waters you can't even perceive with your eyes that are up in, in the distance somewhere, rather think of the clouds that are literally water in the sky. That's, I believe, the right answer. And uh, you guys can roast me in the comments who disagree. Uh, Nad Nad says, Pastor Mike, how do we deal with grief in the right and biblical way? I lost my dad months ago by sudden death. I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry to hear that. You said, I feel worry, anger, and I cry. I'm so tired of the roller coaster feelings. Thanks for your ministry. I, I want to help, and I just feel ill. I feel like Moses. You're like, who am I to answer such a hard and difficult and, and you know situation? Um, I mean, how do I deal with grief? Well, I'll just I'll tell you how I deal with it personally is one of the things that always helps me is I say, um, you know, it's like that song, It Is Well With My Soul. Um, 
you know that you, you've heard the story behind this song uh, this guy lost his whole family his wife his kids he lost them all and he writes this song it is well with my soul now, in, in, in the verse he says you know when when peace like a river attendeth my way obviously it's well with your soul when life is super peaceful but then he says, when sorrows and sea billows roll, they died at sea, his family died at sea. And so he seems to be directly referring to the loss of his wife and children, which is, by the way, I can't imagine a worse, I can't imagine worse people to lose. Like, well, you know you know what I mean? And, um, and he says, when sorrows and sea billows roll, whatever my lot, whatever the situation I get in life is, you have taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul. You need to read the whole song to see why it's well with his soul. He's not saying that I lost my loved ones and it's okay. I lost my loved ones and I'm fine with it. He's saying there are joys in Christ that outlast my current suffering and I'm going to look to those for my peace. I am in the sorrow and sea billow moment, but I am going to be looking to the joys. Like he sings it in one of the verses, Lord, haste the day when my faith will be sight and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. And he talks about the Lord Jesus's return and the trumpet sounding and, and he's singing. And then you're, and you're singing the song. And you're like, it is well, as well with my soul. In light of future glory, in light of the goodness of God and the blessings that are coming your way, you will be flooded with joy for all eternity. In light of that, you can endure through the hard times you're going through now. So Paul talks about and this is what helps me, right? It is being able to say, Lord, I trust you in the midst of this. I don't understand the circumstance. I don't, I don't have it figured out. I don't have the answers to questions like, why did God allow this or that? Or what is God doing through this hardship? I don't know the answers to those questions. I don't try to most of the time. But I do know God is still good in the midst of this. And I can thank him for his goodness. That God has still promised me eternal joys and happiness in the future. And that God is still on the throne. And he's at least doing something through it, even if I have no clue what it is. I can trust him, even though I don't trust my circumstances. I think that when you fall on God's goodness, when you fall on God's promises for your future, that this gives you strength for today. Um, I hope that those things help you and encourage you. Look at Romans chapter eight, right? Where he talks about how, you know, several things there about how our spirits will, will, will just groan and God's spirit groans with us. So I would say cry out to God, even just groaning to the Lord. When you're crying, cry toward God. He hears your heart. He knows all you're going through and cry as a prayer. I mean that. Um, and I'll share, I have a video on this. Actually, I'll, I'll share it below as well. It's also in Romans. So I'm going to share a few Romans videos down below after this um, about that verse. But look at how he talks about how the sufferings of this parent, this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Not even worthy to compare. As bad, as bad as it is, what you have coming is so much better. Man, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Um, you don't have to fix your emotions, but you do need to fix your eyes on Jesus in the midst of all those emotions. Dimaji says, um, what makes language foul? Is it the words itself or the context? Like if I use a word in a friendly way, is it really a foul language? Um, well, language, there's, there's an old quote I heard from, I don't remember what class it was in, in, in college. It was, Language is a system of shared conventions. That is, words are meaningless aside from the meaning we attach to them and we tend to be aware of. Like, I mean these words to mean certain things because you have the same meaning in your head, therefore it means that um, to you. This is not to say that meanings are subjective. Meanings are not subjective, but words are simply selected for sound, gathered sounds to try to communicate objective <laughs> statements um that being said what makes a word a, a word foul is not the sounds of the word it's the context of the, and usage of the term and language is changing all the time so let me give you an example of this right um there are some languages where a word is considered a bad word and in another language the word just means like truck or or like bottle or something and it's, it's a foul word in another language. The sounds don't matter. It's the knowledge of the people around you, your knowledge and their knowledge that say that word has those connotations. So what makes it that way is just culturally present connotations and meanings of words. That changes over time. Some words that had 
no bad meaning in the past. Like look at how the, the King James Version says donkey. Well, I would not translate a version to say it that way nowadays because words change meanings over time. And so, yeah, what makes a word bad is just whatever the cultural context it's in. And you ask, um, um, if I use a word in a friendly way, is it really foul language? That's a tricky statement to make. I don't feel like I can safely answer it yes because of how I think it'll be used if I do. Um, so the, I will say this. There are words that seem like they carry negative connotations all the time, like the F word. Okay, I think the F word is a foul language word currently, and I would not use it. Um, there are words which are strong words, but they're not foul words. Okay, that's a different category of words. And then con contextual usage matters. Then there's words where it's foul language, even though the word itself is not foul at all, but the way you're using it, cruelly, inappropriately, in a foul way, okay, that can feel like it becomes foul. So it's it's just all so complicated. I don't know. I don't feel like I should, I should say flat out yes to that. But <clears throat> if you're like, hey, what if it's me and my buddies and none of us cares if I cuss a lot? I don't care. They don't care. And I'm cussing as part of a joke. Is that enough to me? I'm like, no, I don't think that that's enough to justify the use of, of such language. Because what makes it foul isn't that I don't like it. Plenty of people like it. It's foul because it's kind of like this based sort of terminology. That's my understanding of it. I realize culture shifting and changing on things all the time. And maybe there's a time or there's a situation where what I would consider cuss words in this community of people is considered like... That's not, is that, you think that, oh, I think those words are bad. Like, and I'm not going to try to project that onto them because I recognize language changes over time. Okay. So that's my understanding. Um, Holly Noel says, no, I already did yours a while ago. All right, here we go. Jake Bates. We're almost done. <clears throat> um, oh, and let me quick reminder. Uh, some of you guys ask questions and you feel your questions were skipped over and maybe you feel like they've been skipped over a lot. Like I've tried and tried and tried. There's a decent chance that that question you keep putting in for the Q and A on Fridays that I've already answered it. Which so I try not to answer the same questions all the time so that my content's useful for people. Now, if that's the case, then you want to go to BibleThinker.org and and look at. We have a search feature that lets you search for clips. There's a video search feature and there's a clip search feature. That's the one you want to use. BibleThinker.org, right? Clip search feature and you type in a couple words related to your question and it should bring up any videos where I've already answered that question. So that may be the case. We, I don't want to keep you on the hook. We try to make people aware of the website. I have it at every video. I'm like, look, it's right there. But you know, you got to keep trying. Um, okay. So uh, 18, Jake Bates. I know you've avoided this question in the past. Uh Oh, do you think evolution is plausible theologically? I've never heard a good response to how there would have been death before the fall. Thanks. Okay. Um, there, to me, the evolution issue is a bunch of issues, theologically speaking. Okay, let's let's just ignore science, and we're talking about full on, full on evolution in its in its all its particulars, universal common descent, um, with or without abiogenesis, whatever. Um, but but at least universal common descent. Okay, you're like, hey, theologically, do you think it's plausible? <sighs> I'm more on the fence now than I ever have been before. You're asking where I'm personally at. I'm not teaching this publicly. I'm just personally more on the fence now. And I guess how I feel this impacting me is it makes me just more, I guess, aware of, of those on both sides who have different views and, and accepting of, of people on both sides who have different views. Um, again, I do not think scientifically that it took place i could be wrong that's my opinion it did not take place that way scientifically universal common descent um speciation is one thing that's something i'm not i don't have a problem with that um <clears throat> but but theologically there are issues and one issue you bring up is death before the fall um well there was no human death before the fall so the way some people resolve this and they go oh well then the, the, the ancestors of Adam and Eve, they weren't human until Adam and Eve showed up and boom, Adam and Eve are human. So that you have no human death before the fall. They don't count as real biblical humans or not in God's image. Um, some people, I think John Walton, I think this is his view that God sort of took those amongst all of the evolved animals and grabbed Adam and Eve and then instilled in them the image of God and sort of that makes them different than the rest. So these other people aren't 
humans and they would have lived immortally and eternally had they stayed in the garden and obeyed God, but then they fell and so now there's death. Um, now, when it comes to animal death before the fall, I don't really have that much of a problem with it, to be honest. Um, so that that's a, I guess that's a whole other issue. But I <clears throat> I don't think the arguments against animal death before the fall are actually that convincing. But our, human death before the fall that seems like a pretty big deal to me biblically. So others would have they they would have other views. They could say even um, Adam and Eve were 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 created by just simply divine command in the garden. That some would say this. They didn't evolve over time like that. So then that, that makes those outside the garden animals, whatever they are, they're not humans. They don't count. There's a couple ways to try to reconcile this. I'm trying to remember what, like say William Lane Craig said recently, cause he spent so much time on this and it's been really more of a recent issue for, uh, for at least for his ministry talking about it. And I, and I respect and like him a lot actually in his ministry. Um, not that I'm in agreement on this issue. I don't know. I don't know. So I, I, I hesitate to answer the question, as I'll mention, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm broken record, because I don't know the answers, not because I'm afraid of the answers, not because there's any doubt in my heart towards the word of God. It's only that sort of trepidation that I'm super accountable for the way I teach scripture. And if I declare to you, well, the Bible is young earth and you're needing me out there. And then I'm like, oh, but I'm not so certain about that actually. And, and then I find out I'm wrong. Like I am devastated about that and I should be. And if I teach to you, oh, the Bible's totally compatible with evolution. You can have any view you want, and it's just going to work no matter what. Um, that, that I'm just like, I don't know. What I will say is this. I think Christians, real Christians exist on both sides, and I'm unresolved. When I get resolved, I will happily declare to you as much clarity as I have on those issues. Um, I apologize. I can't be of more help. Let's go to question number 19. Justin Hebert says, if sin cannot enter God's presence, how can Satan present himself before God in Job? Ah, good question, Justin. I think you're on to something. Maybe sin can enter God's presence. Where in scripture does it say that sin cannot enter God's presence? That there's some sort of, like, here's what I heard from some pastors and stuff who are otherwise great guys, right? This is not me ridiculing them. This is just something I heard, and maybe you've heard it too, is if sin enters God's presence, then there's this sort of like automatic impact where like you're judged and destroyed. Where it's like not even something God does on purpose. It's it's like, um, <clears throat> it's like uh, what's the name? Cyclops from the X-Men. And he's got like laser vision effectively. He shoots beams of energy out of his eyes. And it's like, if this guy opens his eyes without his mask on, like automatically it's going to happen. He just fries everything he sees. That that's what happens when God sees sin. It just, just fries it. I don't think that that's a biblical teaching. I do think that there's something along those lines going on in scripture, which is that when someone enters God's presence, there is more awareness of sin. And there's a, there's a natural realization that judgment is likely to come, or at least you're more it's more likely to come when you're standing in God's very presence than if you're not. That seems to be true, but then that's not a rule about what has to happen every time something enters God's presence. So when when, when Isaiah is like, woe is me, I'm, I'm, I've seen God and woe is me because I'm a man of unclean lips. He's aware of God's goodness and holiness. He's aware of his own sin and he's aware that judgment may be coming right now. But then the coal and all this cool stuff in Isaiah 6. But he... Um, you know, he doesn't get judged at that exact moment. Um, it's true that God says, no man may see me and live. So this might be the closest we get to it. When God tells Moses, no man can see me and live. But then God, he does reveal himself to Moses. And a significant amount of God's glory is seen by Moses, such that Moses is shining, he's glowing, right? He's, he's radiating this glory from God, but he couldn't see him fully and live. Now, so he could see partially, but God has to kind of like hide part of himself from us that, that lest we die. So is that dying judgment? You could, let's just say, okay, let's say, let's just say that the, that dying is judgment. Does that mean that Satan would die when he stands before God? Well, Satan's not even in a physical body. So if Satan's not in a physical body, that could change the circumstances for him. But when Isaiah saw the Lord, was he in a physical body or not? 
<laughs> I don't know. Uh, did, did, did he even know? Um, so you could, you could caveat your, oh, if you stand before God, you're going to die. It's automatic, but it, but you'd have to be in a physical body if it was going to be that way. But if that was the case, if that was like a clear biblical teaching, then why is it that Paul, when he says that he stood before God and he saw him, he didn't know if he was in the body or not. He talks about his own vision and he goes, was it bodily or not? I don't even know. So if there was a rule, like you can't bodily see God. Oh, but then here's where the debates get weird, right? Then you could go, well, but Paul was saved. He was in Christ. So he could stand before God. Yeah. But wasn't Moses forgiven because he had grace at the same time? Like in Joe, uh, Jacob wrestled with God and Jacob, when he wrestled with God, that was clearly a physical wrestling with God. But maybe but God didn't reveal himself entirely. There was, God had manifest, it was, I think, a Christophany. Okay, so maybe we shouldn't use the Jacob wrestling example because God's not fully revealing his glory to, to Jacob. He's manifesting himself uh, in, in what was likely a Christophany and revealing only part of himself in a sense. And so, yeah, okay, that probably more like the Moses situation. All that to say, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, Whatever it is, whatever your theology is of whether um, sin can be in the presence of God in any way, shape, or form, it has to include the fact that Satan obviously is evil and is obviously in the presence of God. Maybe it's because he's an angelic being that that this is different than with a human. All right, let's go to question 20. Uh, Jillian Perez says, what's your favorite way to witness to strangers? I don't really know how to answer that question. My favorite way um, is when they're like, hey, what's so different about you? <laughs> the question that nobody ever asks. <laughs> um, wow, you just seem so alive. What is it about you? <laughs> nobody asks that. What What else? Um, my favorite way to witness to them. I'll say when witnessing my favorite thing is getting to the real heart of the gospel um, and being able to talk about um, why why Jesus is needed, right? And so, um, I I I like Ray Comfort's approach. I think that that's like a good little blueprint for you that might give you some ideas on how to witness and share with people. He'll reg and he has tons of videos on Living Waters on the YouTube channel Living Waters. We talks about this and we don't agree on everything, right? But that should be, you should know that anytime I talk about anybody, we probably don't agree on everything, but he, here's a, here's a guy that has spent m more hours witnessing to people than you've probably spent watching TV. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's, there's a, there's a practice and a deliberateness to it and a thoughtfulness to it as far as how to, how to get right to the heart of the issue, how to use questions and a friendly demeanor in order to, um, evoke uh, an awareness of the need for Jesus and so they could realize that there's a problem for which Jesus is a solution. And so I think that there, that you can do that. Um, using questions about the law are, it can be useful, um, cuts through the self-righteous attitude. Most people have pretty quickly. So th that could be something to learn and grow from. Yeah. Um, let me see. There was, I think there was something else I wanted to tell you guys. Something else I was thinking and talking. Not, I, I got nothing. I got nothing. All right. Well, so I'll see you guys uh, in, in two weeks. Friday, I'm going to tackle that question about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'd like to do actually a bit more of a thorough teaching on that. I think that's a good idea. So we'll tackle that one first up in two weeks. And then the rest of the 19 questions, as always, come from the live chat right from you guys. And if you can't wait till then, go to BibleThinker.org. Check out my website. Everything's free on there, right? It's just the videos and stuff, but it's searchable in a way that lets you find specific timestamps. The exact second where I talk about a particular topic for you to think about as you learn to think biblically about everything. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your holy word. We thank you for the answers that scripture gives us and for the answers that we don't know the answers to, the questions we don't know the answers to. We, we thank you that we completely can trust you with that that we, we don't need all knowledge in order to um, feel confident about you, about your word, about Christ. We, we pray that you'd be glorified in our lives. I pray that even right now, you'd be reminding us of what our personal callings are, those you've called us to love and serve, the ways in which you've gifted us, the, the different opportunities we have around us, that we'd see them all in light of ambition for the kingdom of Christ and how to use it for your glory. Help us to really be aware, Lord, we pray right now, 
to be aware of how we can actively serve you with our lives and not just live life with the knowledge of Christ, but live life as an agent for Christ. We pray in Jesus name. Amen.